chapter 7, please, if you will. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, let me read two verses to you and then we'll, we'll go from there and bring some more in. Um, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13 and 14. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be, with, there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Uh, I, I really mean this. I, I'm, I know the Bible is true, but I wish it were reversed. I wish the Bible said many go to heaven, and few there be. None go to hell, actually, but... And that's why we keep thundering the message out because of people that are lost. Did you know we had some folks get saved during revival? You missed a revival meeting. It was a blessing. Miss Lindy got saved. We've had two or three get saved. We've uh, had some join the church and some more that we still, there's I think about three or four more that we still that want to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And uh, that's a good testimony. That's a good testimony for a church to have. And Jesus Christ being exalted. When you lift him up, my dear friend, that is a wonderful thing to do. That's what we're supposed to do. I realize the book of John says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself, unto me. I realize he's talking about being lifted up between heaven and earth on the cross of Calvary. And as a result of him defeating the devil and sin and rising again the third day, that we have the victory. That he is drawing the Spirit of God. If he leaves, the Spirit of God's come. The Comforter is going to come. And he is drawing men to himself every day. Securing men is what the Bible says uh, in the book of uh, Corinthians. Uh, but we lift him up in our speech and our actions that people can see Christ and they'll begin to want exactly what you have. They'll begin to want Christ. Now the Bible again says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now here's the appeal. Here's actually the appeal in verse number 13 and 14 is what Jesus had been contemplating, had what Jesus had been leading up to all throughout his Sermon on the Mount, which begins in chapter number 5. Now, the appeal is your decision about becoming a citizen of the God's kingdom and inheriting eternal life. That's the decision you're going to have to make. I've titled the message, Choices. Choices and Decisions. Amen? Choices. The appeal is your decision about becoming a citizen of God's kingdom and, again, inheriting eternal life. Or remaining a citizen of this fallen world and receiving damnation. Um, you don't do anything to become a sinner, my friend. You're born that way. But because we are a sinner, we do choose to sin. There is one verse that would actually uh, uh, help you and help others maybe to see the truth of God's Word in John chapter number 3 about being saved and lost. In John chapter number 3, in verse number 18. It is a very, very simple verse. And this verse right here would refute a whole lot of false doctrine if you would just read it and believe it. The Bible says in verse 18 of John chapter 3, He that believeth on him is not condemned. A believer is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You don't do anything to be condemned. You're condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look over in verse 36 while we're there in John 3. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It was pretty simple. And again, this Sermon on the Mount, a lot of people think the Sermon on the Mount is the way to salvation. It's not. It's how saved people act. That's what it is. It's how saved people act. Now, God's given you a taste of the kingdom right there in chapter number 5 and 6 and on into chapter number 7. And then he makes the appeal, would you like to be a part of this? Would you like to be a part of this? And so that's what he's doing today. He's asking you if you want to be a part of his family, the royal family on the right highway, on that straight and narrow. 
uh, going through the right gate. If, he, if you'll notice, he does that a lot here in Matthew chapter number seven. He talks about the two gates that's wide and straight. We've already read about it. He talks about the two destinations. That's life and destruction. He talks about the two groups right here in the two verses we read. That's the few and the many. Are you a part of the few or are you part of the many? And then uh, you get on down. And I'm not going to preach on verse 15 through 20, but you've got two trees. You've got two trees. It's good. One's good. One's corrupt. You've got two kinds of fruit. You've got the good fruit and the corrupt fruit. You've got two kinds of people in verse 21, 22, and 23. You've got those that profess, profess faith in Jesus Christ. They, uh, and, and by the way, that's who he's talking about in verse 21 through 23. He's talking about those that profess. Now, the two kinds of people right here is those that are serious and sincere and then those that are false, the false professions. Can a person make a false profession of faith? Sure he can. The false profession is you depending on your good works to get you to heaven. And the Bible does call them right here in verse 21, 22, and 23, works of iniquity. Depart from me. You work, these are not going to get you to heaven. So the Bible says in Hebrews chapter, what is it, chapter 6, we repent, we change our mind about dead works. Works before salvation are works to be repented of. Because there's a lot of us at one time in our life thought that our good would outweigh our bad and then God would let us slip in. That's not true. That's not true. So you have right there the two professions. Then you've got two kinds of builders there in verse number 24. You got the wise builder and the foolish builder. You got two foundations. You got the rock and the sand. You've got two houses, the secure and the insecure. So it's a choice. What I'm getting at is it a choice. The appeal is your decision about becoming a citizen of God's kingdom, to be born again or remain a citizen of this fallen world and die and go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell, neither does Christ. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. The way to life is on God's terms alone. We need to understand this. Please, let me talk to you today. Let me preach to you today. Would you listen? The terms of your salvation are on God's terms alone. God's terms alone. The way to damnation is on any terms a person wants. Did you get that? Salvation's on God's terms. The way to damnation is on any term that you want. Any term that you want. Because every way but God's way leads to the same fate. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You try to figure it out. You try to gain audience with God. You try to build your own house. I'm going to tell you, the Bible said it'll fall, and then it tells you how great the fall of it is going to be. So it's on God's term. The Sermon on the Mount is not for salvation of the soul. I told you that. But what saved people are like. Chapter 5 of Matthew up to this point in chapter number seven, Jesus has been giving God's standards. And I'm like, well, just go back to chapter five here just for a moment. I'm, that, the Sermon on the Mount in, um, in Matthew chapter number five, he has uh, what we call the Beatitudes. In verse two, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. Verse four, for they shall be comforted. The mourning shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You'll keep growing and growing and growing. The Bible said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. On and on and on. This is about saved people, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, up to this point, again, up to chapter number 7, God's telling you how saved people ought to be and giving you God's standards, standards of God that are holy and perfect and that are diametrically opposed to the self-righteousness, self-sufficient, hypocritical standards of man. Look at chapter 5 and verse 20. Chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 20. <clears throat> the Bible said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm looking these Pharisees up. I'm, I'm looking, I'm watching them. Man alive, these guys are top notch. 
They are top notch. They're dotting the I's. It looks like right. Crossing the T's right. They live holy. They live clean. They're, 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 they have a knowledge of the word of God. They're, they're teachers of the law. I mean, some good folks. But then Jesus Christ himself says, himself says, if your righteousness does not exceed their righteousness, you'll no way, no wise, no how, no way get in the kingdom of heaven. That's what it says. Now that becomes a puzzle to a lot of people. If they're so good and they're keeping the law to the best of their ability as touching the law, Paul said, blameless in Philippians chapter number three, how in the world am I going to get in? My righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. And there's only one way that can happen because of imperfect man, John 3, 18. That's for a righteousness other than your own to be laid to your account. And we're, that's what we're talking about here today, making the right choices, making the right choices. Amen. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has shown his, what his kingdom is like and what its people are like and also what they are not like. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few there be that find it. Now Jesus presents a choice of entering into the kingdom or not entering into the kingdom. The Lord focuses on the inevitable decision that every person must make. You're here at the crossroads where you must decide on what gate you're going to enter into today. What gate you're going to enter into and the way that you're going to go. I remember reading a story back in Ruth in the very first chapter where Naomi and Elimelech and Malon and Kelon went down to Moab. There was a famine in Bethel. They left the house of bread and praise. Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem is bread. Judah means praise. They left the house of bread and praise. They went down to the far country. In the far country, they experienced a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. Elimelech died. Malon and Kelon died. And then they had two daughter-in-laws. Naomi was the only one left. She had two daughter-in-laws. Her name was Ruth and Orpha. And the Bible said that both of them came to Naomi crying and weeping. But there was a difference of the choices that they made. One of them wept, which was, she was sincere, wasn't she? She really didn't want to part from Naomi. But then there was one named Ruth that clave. They were standing at the crossroads of a decision in their life. Ruth said, I know if I go. How do I know this? Because the Bible said, your God will be my God. Your family is going to be my family and so on and so on. She made a decision based upon facts and truth that a Moab was not welcome in the congregation of Israel. She said, but I'm going anyway. She made a decision at the crossroads. And some of you need to make that decision this morning at the crossroads of life. I hope you make the right decisions. Many decisions are made in life. But the most critical decision of all is your decision about the Lord Jesus Christ, His person and His work. Hold your place in Matthew. Go over to John just for a moment. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. In John chapter number 4, <clears throat> the Lord said He must needs to go through Samaria. He must needs. As a triangle has three sides, Jesus must needs to go through Samaria. He came to the well, Jacob's well there in Sychar, out of Sychar actually. And uh, he met a woman at the well. And you know the story, and I'm not preaching on the woman at the well today. But nevertheless, he said um, in verse 10, after that, after, she was very defiant, by the way. She said, how be a thou Jew talks to me a Samaritan? Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. There's a, there's a big, big gap there, a big prejudice gap. And we have no dealings with one another. So what are you even talking to me for? But nevertheless, he goes on and on. But verse 10 brings out some truth that I didn't know years ago, but I finally came to the realization of that truth. The Bible said in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, if I knew the gift of God, if I knew the gift of God, God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, the gifts given in verse number 14 of John chapter number 4. Jesus is a gift. His name is everlasting life. If you'll read 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20, that's his name. His name is eternal life. Amen. His name is eternal. If you knew the gift of God, and notice this, what else? It said, who? 
Who? Well, she made a comment, I know Messiah cometh. And she, didn't all she, needed, she didn't know all she needed to know about Messiah. Because he explained himself to her, is what the Bible says. You know, and I thought about that. I made a profession of faith, and a sincere profession of faith. Now, by the way, even real professions are sincere. Brother Donnell and I was talking about this. Sometimes we use that word and say, if you were sincere, it doesn't mean a thing. Well, if I was taught that... Uh, Two plus one equals four. I think you used this illustration, something like this, to this effect. If I was taught that two plus one equals four all of my life, from a, from a time that I could mumble, and, and I'm 64, I've been taught that all of my life, and you come along and you say two plus two equals four, I say, you're wrong. You're wrong. I was taught all of my life two plus one is four and nobody, my teacher doesn't lie and most of all, my mother doesn't lie. So who are you trying to attack here? I'm telling you, Brother Rowan, two plus two equals four. But I was sincere about two plus one, wasn't I? I sure was. So sincerity, not necessarily, just because you were sincere don't mean you're saved, but when you do make a profession, there is sincerity. There, there is sincerity. Um, so they made a profession of faith. I made a profession of faith when I was nine years old, not knowing the person of Christ. And I've said this over, and you may disagree with it, and I'm, I don't know. I'm sorry if you do. But um, in Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth. It tells you what you had to hear, the gospel of your salvation. Also, after that you believed. After you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the question entered my mind, what did I believe when I said I believed? I sure did not believe that Jesus Christ was Messiah nor God. I just thought he was some baby born in Bethlehem's manger. And from that point, we're all supposed to pay homage. I did not know he was eternal. And repeatedly through this book, he declares deity and eternality. Always he declares it. So I finally found out when I was 26 years old that Jesus Christ was before Abraham. I finally, and I read that in John chapter 8, by the way. I believe it's John 8. Read that, that before Abraham was, I am. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1. The Bible said in verse 14 of John chapter 1, the Word was made flesh. And dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's God. Now, I can go on and on about deity of Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Only God can forgive sin. He was totally God, totally man at the same time. Read about Him. He was in the boat asleep. He was so much man that He was tired and He went to sleep. But He was so much God that they woke Him up and He said three words, Peace be still. There was a calm. The wind stopped, the rain stopped, and the waves stopped. Just like, the, just like that. Amen. That's how much God he was. He's totally God. He's totally man. So I began to learn about him. And I began to learn his work of redemption was complete. The ultimate choice that determines our destiny, it's a decision. It's a decision. Contrary to what some preach that Jesus does call on men to make a decision. There's some people think it's already predestined. Let me tell you something. It was a choice. It's always been a choice. It was a choice in the garden when Eve listened to Satan and totally deceived, took of the fruit. It was a choice of Adam with his eyes wide open, knowing it was wrong, knowing it was a sin. Adam was not deceived, and he partook of the fruit. And what he did is plunge, and he actually did it to be with his bride. He plunged the whole human race into sin that day, and everyone born of the seed of man had a sin nature. And then the second Adam came along, and his name was Jesus Christ. You know what he did? with his eyes wide open, willfully became sin for us who knew no sin. T to do what? To redeem his bride. He wants his bride. 
And we're the apple of his eye, my dear friend. We are the, the, the jewels of his eye. Is the church, those that are born again. So what the first Adam messed up, the second Adam fixed up when he died and defeated the devil and rose again the third day. Amen. And it's a choice that you're going to have to make. Do you believe him or do you not believe him? Amen. So it was a choice in the garden. Did you know, according to Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse number 19, turn over there. Let's just turn over there a minute. Deuteronomy 30. Follow along if you will. If you can't, write them down. Write them down. In the wilderness, it was a choice. And for people to say that you do not have a free will and do not have a choice, they're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. You have a choice. You, you have a choice. God created you in His image. Not physically. God created Himself in your body, soul, and spirit. Intellect, emotions, and will. Human beings have the privilege of making a choice. And I hope you make the right choice. Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse number 19 and 20. The Bible said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. All right, so they made a choice. Israel in the wilderness made a choice. Another choice, when Israel came into the promised land, if you'll notice in... Um, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua, Deuteronomy, then go on to Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. And the last book of Joshua you'll find in uh, verse number 13, 14, and 15. Joshua chapter 24. They had a decision to make in the wilderness. They have a decision to make in the promised land. The Bible said, and I have given you, verse 13, a land for which you did not labor. And cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of the vineyards and, and olive yards which you planted, and do not, and, and do you eat? And, excuse me, planted not, do you eat? Now, in other words, God put it there. You didn't even have to labor for it. It's there for you. And then verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, notice this, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua said, we will what? Serve the Lord. Made a choice. Made an intelligent choice. In Mount Carmel... And I'm not going to turn over there, but you know what happened on Mount Carmel when Elijah called down the fire of God? In 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 21, Elijah, God through Elijah, asked the people to make a choice. Make a choice. The true God or the false God, Baal. And then Jesus, Jer well actually God commanded Jeremiah to set a choice before his people. And Jeremiah set a choice before his people in Jeremiah chapter number 21 and verse number 8. And then I go all the way over here to John chapter 6 if you want to. And I could give you a lot more. All through the Bible are choices. And for someone to say that we don't have a free will and have the will to make a choice or a decision concerning Christ is not reading the same book that you and I have in our laps right now. We make a choice. We preach the gospel. Missionaries are sent out. And everyone deserves to make a choice. Amen. All right. And anyway, look at uh, John, uh, John chapter 6. In John chapter number 6, <clears throat> three verses, 66. From that time, many of his disciples, many of Christ's disciples went back and walked no more with him. I'll tell you why they did, because he started um, giving a pretty hard lesson on drink my blood and eat my flesh. And we know that the Bible itself said these things are spiritual. 
He's talking about, he's talking about receive what Christ did with his blood, with the forgiveness of his sin and receive the death of his body. Receive what he did for you is sufficient to get you to heaven. But anyway, in John chapter number six, the Bible said at this time, many of his disciples, verse 66, went back and walked no more with him. Verse 67, then said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure, sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So even Jesus appealed for a choice. In Matthew chapter number 7, back in our text, in Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13 and 14, this is the call that God has been making to man since man turned away from him. I encourage all of you. I encouraged somebody the other day, and they came to me yesterday and said that I've done what you've asked, Brother Rowan. I encourage them. They, they're struggling with their salvation, and I, I said, why don't you go back? I said, everyone tells you to read the book of John. You've read that several times. You're still having a struggle. I've told you to read the, the, uh, the, the Paul's epistles because he specifically talks about salvation by grace through faith. And still struggling, I said, do me a favor and go back and read Genesis 1 through 11. I said, if you, can, if you can get established in the truth that God is, and God created everything around you, and how sin came into the world through Adam, and what God's, God's um, uh, the, the consequences was, were that God actually brought a flood upon the world, a real flood, a universal flood. Not hard for me to believe. Because God said it. And you get established in that truth, you'll have no problem accepting the rest of the Bible. Amen. Because it was all beautiful and right and pure until sin came in. And Genesis 3 is that pivot point where sin came in the world. Now we need an answer for sin. We need a remedy. And Jesus Christ, from, the, from that point on, Genesis 3.15, God, and actually since the beginning, Genesis 1.1, but in Genesis 3.15, we have a promised redeemer that is going to, the Bible called it enmity between the woman's seed and the devil. Amen. And the Bible said that that seed would bruise the head of Satan. And in the process, Jesus would have his heel bruised and that he would have to die on Calvary. But he defeated the devil. I said, do you get a hold of that? You see, it's a choice. It's always a choice. And again, God's, God's been making, it's, it's a choice for either for him or against him. And uh, God's made every effort and spared no cost in wooing man back to himself. He's provided and shown the way, leaving nothing to man but the choice. God made his choice by providing Jesus the way of redemption and the by the way, it's redemption for every man. So you have a choice to make. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm getting off on a, from the, kind of the outline. But when you talk about redemption, I want, I want you to realize redemption means to purchase. To purchase. So when a preacher says, come and be redeemed, he's really not rightly dividing the word of truth, is he? Because Jesus purchased the world with his blood and his death on the cross of Calvary. What a man needs is to be regenerated. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, it's quickened. Ye that were dead in trespasses, he's quickened those who were dead in trespasses and sins. So man needs to be regenerated. How's a man regenerated? When he believes Jesus Christ, when he believes the person and work of Christ, and how that God's satisfied. So we go on. This is a call that God's been making. And this is a supreme appeal that you choose Him. The choice is between the one and the many. The one right and the many wrong. Jesus said, I make no apologies. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're my age, a lot of us went through a time in our lives that we thought that all paths led to God. And maybe you still think that. I don't know. 
All paths lead to God. I said, God's a loving God. So I'm sure that probably Buddha was their Jesus. And I'm sure that on down the line, Hare Krishna was their Jesus. You think I'm playing with you. I entertained it. I said, since God's a loving God, then all, then there must be 15 ways to heaven or 100 ways to heaven because God's not going to let any of these people that's worshiping rocks and monkeys and trees and idols, maybe that person that represented them was their Jesus. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way. There's no other way. You're going to come through Jesus Christ or you're going to die and go to hell. And the choice is yours to make. And hopefully you'll make that today. Amen. Now, the divine accomplishment, that's what you're going to believe. Divine accomplishment or human achievement. Verse 21, 22, and 23 says it's not by human achievement. It's divine accomplishment or or human achievement. Jesus Christ did it all. Divine accomplishment makes true Christianity stand alone. Think about it. True Christianity. Because true Christianity believes that Jesus Christ did it all. Did it all. And I pray you'd trust Him before it's eternally too late. Amen? Um, isn't it interesting... As we close, isn't it interesting that how men create new religions to accommodate their shortcomings? Listen to me now. And when they create these new religions for their shortcomings, they make something that's humanly achievable. By meet, and how does he do that? Well, by meeting his own standards his own attainable standards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forge a religion that man could actually meet. Yeah, and that's what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to sell everybody on it, and then you're going to feel better about yourself because you had a part in it. That's what false religion does. By meeting his own attainable standards, man therefore considered himself righteous lower God's standards and raise their own estimates of themselves. So man does not see himself in need of a Savior anymore. After all, there's some good in him. It's false religion. Let me tell you something. There's nothing good in you. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? From the top of your head to the sole of your foot, you're like a putrefying sword that can't be mollified with ointment, Isaiah chapter 1. The Bible said that under your tongues are poison of asps. Your feet are swift to shed blood. You're guilty from top to bottom. No soundness whatsoever. But then came Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. You, He's the perfect one. He's the perfect one. He made a choice to take care of your sin. A covenant with himself. Genesis 15. Hebrews chapter number 6. Chapter 2. He made a covenant with himself. Take care of your dirty, rotten sin. And the Bible said that he was at propitiation in 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. He's a propitiation for our sin, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That propitiation, that word means satisfactory sacrifice. The sacrifice of Christ satisfied the demands of a holy God. You need to make a choice that you're satisfied with what God's satisfied with and be born in God's family today. Amen? Let's stand to our feet, please, if you will. Oh, thank God for Jesus. Yes, sir. Oh, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and goodness. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us during this time of invitation. And Lord, as we've um, lifted your name up, dear God, I pray that you would work on hearts, exalt yourself through your word and the Spirit of God convicting, reproving as only you can. And that lost soul will be saved before it's eternally too late. For it's in Christ's name.
we ask. Amen.